Welcome to the third in this week's series of lectures as we continue to focus in on duties to the client. What I want to focus on in this discussion is information barriers or as they were called back when I was a girl, Chinese walls. And the idea I always understood is a Chinese wall was supposed to be as strong as the Great Wall of China. Um, it's a metaphor that was used for arrangements that happened within offices essentially to keep uh, information separate from people who didn't need to know about it uh, and to with the purpose of protecting that information that belongs to uh, clients or former clients. Essentially, once we've worked out that we have no conflict of interest and we can act or more likely with an information barrier situation where there is a conflict of interest, but the client has waived the client's right to require either the contractual duty of confidence under the retainer to be maintained or both the contractual duty and the ethical duty to maintain and continue to act in the best interests of a current client. Um, they have waived the potential conflict. I use the word potential there very loosely for reasons that we've discussed early earlier. Uh, they have agreed that the, the firm can act for somebody else on the basis that their confidential information is protected. And so the idea is, um, while, while the term is a metaphor, and to be quite frank, the Chinese walls terminology is rarely, if ever, used in practice these days. I just think it's useful for you to, to understand where the metaphor comes from. Um, so those information barriers are rarely these days physical uh, impediments to the access to information. Now, when I started in practice, uh, they were physical impediments. Uh, the uh, information would be kept in a locked filing cabinet. Uh, teams of people working on different matters would be located in different buildings, in different physical spaces. But for the reasons that you are very aware of now because of our focus on technology, information is more than just pieces of paper and stuff rolling around in people's heads. The, it is very much something that is able to be mined. Data is able to be looked at in ways that we've never really understood or seen before. Um, and if somebody wants to put pieces of information together, they've been, they're able to do so in ways now that they've never been able to do before. Uh, so essentially what an information barrier does is it restricts confidential information to part of a law firm or to particular operators or particular practitioners within the law firm. And so the arrangement is theoretically intended to avoid the conflict of interest that would otherwise occur if the information was accessible to the firm. Now, many have said that, you know, the Great Wall of China is not the analogy that was used. I suspect it's um, somewhat racist origins, but Chinese walls have often been described more like Japanese screens. As many of you will know, Japan is very, very prone to earthquake and traditional housing in Japan is made of very lightweight material uh, so that people don't get hurt when um, uh, the walls come tumbling down. Uh, one judge has gone so far as to refer to information barriers not as Chinese walls or Japanese screens, but as dingo fences. Just really pointing out that for large, uh, to a large extent, they've been very ineffective. And there's actually very few cases where a party who has been seeking to get an injunction to prevent a law firm from acting for somebody because doing so would be a conflict of interest against their interests as a former or current client of that firm. Very few cases uh, have seen the law firm successful. Uh, the clients have largely succeeded. We'll talk about one uh, where that was not the case, but for the most part you'll see in your reading that uh, the Japanese screen analogy or the dingo fence analogy may well be uh, more applicable.
Key case in this area is Prince Geoffrey uh, Borkaya's case. Uh, prince Geoffrey was um, a prince. He was also the Minister for Finance in Brunei. This is a leading case and it went to the House of Lords. And why it's useful for you is uh, it's good law. Um, in preparing for this class, um, I had a look at it uh, and I often look and see how recently cases I'm going to talk about uh, have been um, discussed in the courts um, and it's been cited three or four times this year already, which um, demonstrates uh, the importance of, of the, uh, the law that we get from this case. Um, but I think also the fact it's useful to you because it addresses both concurrent and successive conflicts. And it distinguishes between the duties that we owe our current clients and the duties that we owe to our past clients. So in this particular case, it actually involved KPMG and KPMG had previously acted for the prince in relation to certain matters. Um, he was accused of um, meddling, shall we say, in the financial affairs of the state of Brunei for his own profit. Um, and KPMG had a lot of information as professional services provider, so uh, it acted uh, as a professional advisor in this context, uh, so not as a, as a big four accounting firm effectively, not as a law firm, but the law stands firm for us as well. Um, and as a consequence, they had a lot of information relating to his financial affairs, etc. Subsequently, KPMG, um, a number of years later, accepted instructions from the state of Brunei uh, in relation to actions that it uh, was taking against the minister or considering taking against the minister. I can't remember what stage the litigation was at at that stage. Uh, I think um, the, the Prince of Prince Geoffrey has his name on many, many a case, shall we say. Um, so ultimately the House of Lords held that KPMG had a duty to keep the information that it had about Prince Geoffrey absolutely confidential. So KPMG's attempts to keep the information from being disclosed by taking on the measures that it took, uh, its purported information barriers, were not legally sufficient. The court mentioned that the use of information barriers, at that stage they were calling them Chinese walls, could have worked in some instances, particularly where the concept is plainly established. But it didn't believe or didn't see that KPMG had done enough in that particular circumstance. The problem, the court said, was that the arrangements involving Prince Geoffrey's case with KPMG uh, were confined to one department of the firm and there was a physical separation. And that was just simply not enough. And that was because in that case there was interaction between the staff and the management of the separated department um, and other parts of the firm. There was inevitable movement of information and there was an, what the court referred to as an unwarranted risk of confidential information being disclosed. Ultimately, the court pointed out that the issue of preserving confidentiality is not a qualified duty. Um, there was an apparent conflict of interest on the part of KPMG before they even accepted instructions to act for the state of Brunei. Uh, the House of Lords found that KPMG should have considered that accepting such an engagement for the Brunei government would essentially place the confidential data that it had about Prince Geoffrey at risk right from the very beginning. Now, oh, sorry, I've got my clicker. I'm going around to change things. Sitting down, I don't normally do it. Um, so... What did it say about concurrent clients? I think this is really important. It's taken straight from the Prince Jeffrey judgment. Um, for those of you who are playing along at home, I'm going to talk through what's on the slide so you don't need to stop driving or running or walking your dog, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and for those of you who um, are watching on YouTube, um, know that all of the language is on the slide, but I'm going to walk through it and I'm going to have the language on you know, both of these slides uh, today so you'll get to see it. Now she says that, I have to zoom it a little bit myself. So it is otherwise, so the question of confidentiality. 
where the court's intervention is sought by an existing client because of fiduciary, so it's pointing out the fiduciary nature of a relationship that KPMG had with Prince Jeffrey, cannot act at the same time both for and against the same client. And the firm is in no better position. So an individual, we're absolutely clear that an individual, let's use a lawyer in this context, where there is a fiduciary relationship, they cannot act for and against the same client. And as a consequence, the firm that they work for also cannot act at the same time for both sides of the transaction. Gendered language, I'm going to change it. A person cannot, without the consent of both clients, act for one client while their partner is acting for another in the opposite interest. Their disqualification has nothing to do with confidentiality of client information. So that prohibition against a person and their partner or their colleague acting against or each other is not to do with the confidentiality of the client information. It is based on the inescapable conflict of interest which is inherent in this situation. This is not to say that such a consent is not sometimes forthcoming or that in some situations it may not be inferred. In other words, it is possible, but there needs to be consent and there needs to be strong existing information barriers. So that's when it comes to concurrent clients. So what did they say in relation to former clients? House of Lords said whether if a former client wants to intervene in a firm or a lawyer, a fiduciary, seeking to act for somebody um, who has opposite interests from them, but they're no longer a client, the position might be entirely different from the first uh, example. The court's jurisdiction cannot be based on any conflict of interest, real or perceived, because there isn't any. Uh, the, there is no longer a fiduciary relationship. It's a former client. The fiduciary relationship which subsists between solicitor and client comes to an end with the termination of the retainer, the termination of the contract. From that point on, thereafter, is the language that the court used, from that point on, a solicitor has no obligation to defend and advance the interest of the former client. The only duty to the former client which survives is a continuing duty to preserve the confidentiality of information imparted during the relationship, during the retainer. So concurrent conflicts uh, is a question of fiduciary relationship and a question of the ability of an individual and by reference their firm to act in the best interests of a client if they're acting for the opposite interests in the same matter. In relation to successive contract, what matter, sorry, successive conflicts, what matters is the duty to preserve confidential information. So the next question that comes up regularly is, okay, if particularly in relation to a successive con a conflict, it's quite clear that if we can protect the information, um, we can protect somebody's confidentiality, what do we need to do to have an effective information barrier? Um, and the courts um, have a number of, uh, there's a number of things we can get straight from the courts here, including Prince Jeffrey's um, case. Um, but another one here that, uh, again, Del Pont will talk about in some detail is the Mark and, Marks and Spencer, as in the shop in the UK, and Freshfields. To be effective and to have some hope of legality, an information barrier needs to be an established part of the organisational structure of the firm. It can't be created ad hoc. So it can't be created for the purposes of the proposed behaviour or be proposed retainer. The firm itself needs to have systems and procedures in place that are designed to ensure that only confidential information that belong, oh, sorry, all confidential information that belongs to a client is maintained confidentiality. Um, or confidentially, 
very hard to say all the versions of that word. Um, so one of the things that keeps coming up in the cases is the extent to which the way that people move around within an office in a large organisation and the way that uh, electronic communications are growing in use, it is very difficult to make an effective information barrier. And there's almost a presumption in the earlier cases that it's a considerable improbability. Now, um, again, on the slide here, there's no way you're going to be able to read what I put on that slide. It's really just from the opening section of, and I put a QR code there so that you can download the guidelines. Um, I've, I've put this particular version there. It's actually published. This version is published by uh, the Law Society of Queensland. But basically, these guidelines were developed by the Law Society of New South Wales and the LIV, our own Law Institute of Victoria. Um, and basically, now let's let's actually stand back from this for a second. Remember what the law societies and the law institutes are. They are essentially our union as lawyers, like let's call a spade a front end loader. Um, they are the representative body. We've talked about uh, in the past how they're involved in, um, at, at earlier points were involved directly in our regulation. They, they Their purpose is for, to advocate for their members. I am a Law Institute member. I hope you are too. Membership is free for students uh, and you know, they're basically our representative body. Uh, just because I'm a member doesn't mean that I can't look at them critically and think about what their purpose is. Now, clearly, um, we've had, keep coming back to this discussion, uh, is the practice of law a business or is it a profession? Uh, I think it's pretty clear. I think it's both. Um, and what we've seen over the last 30 years is an extraordinary growth in the size uh, and of law firms. Um, when I started in one of the biggest law firms in the country, there were less than 100 partners in that firm. Um, I, uh, the, the size of the law firms now, there are many firms with thousands of partners internationally who will never meet each other. Actually, interestingly enough, um, it wasn't a law firm, but I was at a breakfast the other day uh, at uh, at a formal function, um, it's so nice to go out and hear people speak. I was listening to Fred Hilmer talk about uh, boards and, and what's happening in corporate governance. And on either side of me, there were partners from a one of the large um, uh, consulting firms. Uh, so the big four, as we've referred to them, um, and they had never met each other. They were both partners in that firm, but they had never met each other. Um, and the same can happen with law firms quite quite regularly. Um, so, so we're talking about large organisations, um, large businesses with deep expertise. And so if you are the expert lawyer on section blah, blah, blah of the Stamp Duty Act as it impacts logistics providers um, and in the health industry, you have very deep and specific knowledge about an area of law. And there might be six entities in the country that need that expertise. Um, and they all want to work with you because you are, let's face it, you went to RMIT. You are brilliant at everything that you do. Um, they only want to work with you, but of course, they want to make sure that their competitors don't get access to the important information about the way that they're thinking about their business or their legal strategy or the terms of their contracts or the way that they structure their tax affairs, whatever it happens to be. I've already forgotten the random example that I picked. Um, and I think it's, um, so, so there are practical reasons uh, for wanting to be able to achieve useful outcomes. Um, but at the same time, um, when we look at the guidelines and the way that they've been prepared, they are relatively simple. And they're really just trying to find a way that lets the membership do the business that they want to do. Um, so how does it work? Um, uh, the, the law societies and the law institute are essentially hoping that courts will be less critical of firms that have tried to meet these kind of guidelines 
But ultimately, even compliance with these guidelines is not going to be sufficient if the individual facts of a case don't adequately protect the confidence that former clients um, are entitled to. Um, so in particular, unless and until the impact of any duty of loyalty to a former client is clarified throughout the whole country, the effectiveness of any information barrier is going to remain quite uncertain. What is certain then? Um, pending clarification or specific laws in relation to the matter, information barriers don't afford an automatic force of law and they can give false hope that the considerable expense um, that firms go to in creating a barrier will be justified um, and really each of the firms and individual practitioners are going to need to turn their minds to the issues in each case. Um, I put a QR code there so that you can find um, the information barrier guidelines. Um, they're a little bit old now, like they were made in 2015. Um, and as you're aware, there have been significant leaps in the use of technology over that time. Uh, you now have a pretty solid understanding of the way that AI works and that AI can help us make sense of information. You're some of you doing your assignment will be really thinking about the way that search tools work as well um, and the way that enterprise search functionality could help us as practitioners be more efficient and effective at what it is that we do. But what does that mean uh, for our duties of loyalty to former clients? Um, and are the guidelines that the um, Law Institute and Law Societies are uh, are recommending, are they going to be enough? A real live issue in relation to information barriers too, or that ongoing duty to former clients to maintain confidential information is the inadvertent disclosure. So in an inadvertent disclosure, it can be as simple as somebody hearing something, overhearing something in a discussion. More and more firms are now adopting a um, open plan approach to work. Um, now, I've not met a lawyer yet who's in love with open plan, let me tell you. Um, but often this will be one, and it's quite a genuine, it sort of sounds a bit petty, but it is actually a genuine concern. How do I talk to my team about issues or uh, examples, um, things that are going on without being at risk of other teams or other potentially conflicted individuals hearing important information. And lawyers are smart people, right? Um, you can have information about one, hear information about two, and it'll add up to way more than three because you're in that ability to, you've got that innate ability to synthesize and problem solve. Um, also, lots of, um, uh, lots of information barrier processes require people to have secure passwords, uh, to file things in particular ways, to follow systems and processes. Um, lawyers rarely identify as people who are excited about using cyber technology, uh, cyber security technologies, who are excited about filing and um, keeping things in order. They're often very reliant on third parties to do those things. And of course, it can also happen completely socially or inadvertently. I will never forget. Um, it's many, many years ago now, but I was sitting on a crowded train on my way home from uh, work one day. And there was a, um, a person sitting next to me who was on their mobile phone, clearly to their PA assistant, legal assistant, or uh, perhaps a junior lawyer, I don't know. But during the course of their phone call, I heard that person basically give their assistant their password so that uh, their password was in fact a number and a word which I easily identified, particularly when they got off at the same station as me as a street in my suburbs, so most likely their house address, gave their, uh, 
referred to the name of a client, referred to the amount or a price that they said, then said would not be disclosed in the stock exchange announcement that was about to be made the next morning. Um, 15 kinds of wrong. Um, now, as it turned out, I worked at a different firm um, which actually acted on the other side of that deal. How unlucky was that guy? Now, I didn't do anything with that information. Um, what I did do was I sent an email the following morning to um, the firm concerned, it was one of the larger firms, to report that I had overheard this level of information. Um, and I don't know what happened after that. Um, I think that's a matter for the firm to deal with. Um, I know, that makes me sound like a dobber, absolutely. Dobber being a typical legal expression, not even a little bit. Um, but I do think anybody on that carriage could have heard that information. I did hear it and it could have been quite valuable to me as it turned out. Um, but I, I, I think it, um, it behoves us as members of the profession to act professionally and to call out behaviour that is unprofessional. Others might have done differently. And let's, you know, we've got to think about it. Who hasn't mistakenly sent an email to the wrong addressee? I've done it. Um, who hasn't sent a text message to the wrong person or replied in the wrong group chat or sent a message to one person or thinking you're sending it to one person and it goes to everyone? It is easily done. Um, and so the systems and processes that are in place to make an information barrier work need to contemplate these things and need to, and the firms need to develop cultures that ensure that the chances of inadvertent disclosure is absolutely minimal. So do they ever work? Do we ever see information barriers that work? Let's talk about Frau Hau Finance and Fees Ruthening. Now, Fees Ruthening used to be a household name in the old um, olden days. Very large firm for the time in Queensland is now part of the firm that uh, we refer to as Allens. Well, I refer to it as Allens. They change their names, these firms. So it's Allens Linklaters, I think. Um, now one of the largest firms in the world. Um, so, oh, basically at the time, like I said, large firm, Queensland firm, 28 partners. It's like suburban, small suburban firm these days, I think. Um, so uh, fees reading had been retained to act against a former client whose work had been carried out by a discreet section within the firm. And the new retainer was handled by a completely different part of the firm. The sections dealt with one area of operations under the control of different partners and they had completely separate support staff. So we could look at it like this. Before the re instructions were even received, there were two parts of the firm. They were completely physically and transactionally separate from each other. Um, and this is one of the few cases where a Chinese wall or an information barrier was found to be permitted. Justice Lee found that in effect a wall already existed and the structure had led to a reduction in the scope for potential conflict. The existing structure combined with the undertakings that were given to the former client were considered an adequate safeguard for the possibility of a conflict arising. So. What else is there to talk about in relation to this? It is interesting as we think about law, uh, the business of law as opposed to the profession of law um, and what information barriers mean in relation to anti-competitive practices. So the duties that we have to form with clients could be seen as an anti-competitive practice. Um, that and there are plenty of the tobacco companies used to use this as a strategy significantly. Uh, so back when there was a lot of tobacco litigation, particularly in the US in the 90s and the early noughties, um, many of the big uh, tobacco companies would basically engage um, law firms all over the US and the world to act for them in minor matters, 
effectively to prevent them from acting for plaintiffs against them. Um, and so one could argue that this itself is an anti-competitive practice. Um, so restrictions on the use of information barriers have a prima facie, so an on their face anti-competitive effect because they prevent law firms from offering services to more than one client on the same transaction. Uh, so Jim Spiegelman, who at the time was New South Wales uh, Chief Justice, um, basically referred to Chinese walls as dingo fences um, because he basically saw them as a complete failure. Um, and he said that the, um, the Chinese walls or the information, the dingo fences as he called them, um, entrench conflicts of interest and to that extent they hurt a greater public interest public confidence in the administration of justice. Um, and so unless our, um, unless we have information barriers that are effective and have that dual purpose of allowing the business of law to expand but protect information belonging to former clients, um, we will have this, this tug, this ethical dilemma that pulls on us. So what, what do we draw from this? Um, the starting point, I think, is that information is going to move between a firm. In fact, as firms get bigger um, and more separate, separated out, um, that doesn't actually get any, um, any smaller, that particular issue. Um, in f one would think, as the bigger firms are, the harder, and people don't know each other, the harder it is for them to talk to each other about information. But increases in um, the price, effectiveness and speed and abilities of technology mean that if somebody wants to find out something, they absolutely can. Uh, and that we can retain information significantly um, over time. So the Starting part, uh, starting place when we um, begin with thinking about where our duties are is the presumption that if there is a conflict, the firm can't act. We can't separate out. And so if one person in the firm acts, then another person cannot act um, against that person uh, or against that person's client would be a more precise way of saying that. In cases involving quasi-criminal um, or criminal charges, quasi-criminal charges, family law cases, there is such a strong tendency towards the appearance of injustice that the presumption becomes virtually irrebuttable. So you will find that um, it, it is just not appropriate, it, regardless of the strength of your chi a Chinese wall, you cannot act on both sides of a divorce. Um, you cannot, you need to get independent legal advice um, or the parties need to get independent legal advice. Um, in other cases, the presumption can be rebutted by clear and convincing evidence that effective measures have been taken to ensure that no disclosure has occurred or will in the future ex uh, occur. So we start with a presumption, you cannot act, but we can rebut that presumption if we have all of our ducks in a row. These need to be truly exceptional cases and the burden of satisfying the court will be a heavy one. Effective measures could take the form of structural separation, independent operation within the firm, they would need to be reinforced by carefully documented procedures, there needs to be recurring education for example, compliance monitoring, there needs to be a consequence, some kind of sanction where there is a breach. Extensive undertakings need to be given on behalf of the client, a current client, current practitioners and previous practitioners will also be necessary. So the courts are unlikely, we've seen from the cases, to accept walls, screens, barriers or electronic procedures that are created on an ad hoc basis or for a particular piece of, a particular piece of litigation, a, a particular matter, because they're most likely, uh, well, really because they're going to they're not likely to be followed. Um, unless there is a culture of separating out information and there are cultural norms that mean that confidentiality t is taken absolutely, oh, excuse me, I've got the hiccups, 
absolutely seriously um, and that the communication practices as such, that information is constrained to matters, it is going to be very, very difficult to achieve anything uh, of this, uh, uh, to achieve an effective information barrier. So what does this mean for us? Um, I think one of the things that it's going to mean for you as future practitioners is you're really going to need to think about the ways in which the technologies that you use could inadvertently end up impacting these really important duties that you have to the client or ramming up and potentially breaking those walls or barriers that you have in place. Um, the easier it is to communicate, the easier it is to leak information. Improvements in computing speed, AI, search capability, um, in the ease of using these tools all mean that if somebody wants to find something out, then it's much, much easier than it ever has been for them to look. And it could be as simple as you're acting for somebody in relation to something uh, and you're just looking across other files in the firm electronically to find samples of previous transaction documents only to find really juicy information that is relevant to your file or to your client and, um, uh, and, and a competitor or their relationship with a competitor or a customer or a supplier. Um, and, and then you're in the position where to act for the best interest of your client, you need to share that information with them. But to do so would be a breach of your firm's duty to the former or concurrent client who's on the other side of that wall. Um, so interestingly, we're always looking for technologies that are easier than ever to use, but in fact, we can be creating issues simply by doing that. Um, uh, I think we also need to think about social media, even LinkedIn and things like that in relation to these kind of issues as well, particularly when it comes to inadvertent disclosure. The ways that we communicate with our clients and with each other are changing all of the time. Um, I've been thinking quite a bit recently about electronic communications and I've been noticing in my conversations with um, older lawyers especially, they think about electronic communications as email. But actually, when we look at the way the law defines what an electronic communication is, and if we look at the ways we actually communicate with each other, I think we could also think about SMS, WhatsApp, Facebook and Instagram messages, DMs. We could we can communicate using TikTok if we want to. Um, and so as there are more and more ways to communicate and more and more ways to link up with each other, I, mean, I have thousands of LinkedIn contacts and sometimes I really struggle to remember how or why I know that person. Um, we can find ourselves um, inadvertently sharing or receiving information without um, really thinking it through. Um, in preparing for today, one of the things that I found um, that I thought I would share with you is quite a useful um, article about this um, from a Law Institute Journal article earlier this year. Um, again, I put a QR code on the slide next to me for that. Um, I think it might be closed to members um, and again, membership for law students is free. so why wouldn't you? Uh, so I'm not going to be shy about sharing it with you. That's all I've got for this week. Next week we're going to be talking about, um, we're going to finish off our discussion of duties to the client, um, which will probably be about half of the time that I spend with you anyway. We'll be looking at retainers and everything to do with costs. Don't worry, nobody's going to make you do maths. Uh, and we'll start our discussions around our duties to other practitioners as well. Um, I'll talk to you then. Cheers.